What's up, everybody? We are live. Sit down, YouTube page, hanging out, doing a live stream. Uh, as always, make sure you check out the Sit Down and Organize Crime podcast every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. And I also want you to go check out the original Gangsters podcast. I talked about this the other day. I was on that show with the great Scott Berenstein and his boy Jimmy. Uh, they talk about everything crime, everything OC, everything drug gangs. Scott is one of the OGs in this business. Scott Bernstein's a friend. He joins me now from Detroit. Scott Bernstein. Yeah. Scott, what's happening, buddy? I'm I'm straight from uh, Eminem land, right you off are. Eight Mile. Right off Shout Eight Mile. Eminem baby. too. New new story this week. Yeah, Eminem um, is going to be uh, in the new Black Mafia Family show. It's going to be on Stars. It premieres next month, and uh, it's his, his return to acting. Um, for the first time since eight mile. That's true. I never thought about that. That's right. I guess it will and he's be playing white boy, and he's playing white boy, Rick. You think Ooh. he can do that? Well, from what I hear, it's a, um, well, yeah, we'll do a little, not a deep dive, but like a mini deep dive real quick in a little backstory. So right after eight mile, M&M was going to do a white boy, Rick movie. This would have been in 2004. Wow. Um, all the people from 8 Mile, the director, um, Curtis Hansen, Brian Grazer, who's the producer, uh, the writer, um, Scott Silver, were all going to come back and and do, uh, do White Boy Rick. And they were uh, in negotiations and they already start writing the script and Eminem was going to play Rick. And then Rick got in trouble in prison. Um, and got arrested for doing some dirt behind bars. And that led the whole project to um, kind of implode. So Eminem had been kind of circling the White Boy Rick story for, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, now he's getting an opportunity on 50 Cent's new television show, which is based on uh, BMF, Black Mafia Family, which started in Detroit. Uh, in the late '80s, early '90s, but th their reputation far exceeds the you know the city limits of Detroit. It it went nationwide, worldwide. Uh, Black Mafia Family was like uh, the Walgreens or CVS uh, or Rite Aid of uh, the cocaine game back in the late '90s, uh, early 2000s. They had uh, you know outlets on every corner in America, um, and 50 Cent's telling the true story of Big Meech, who was the, the leader of that group. And so M Eminem is going to have a cameo this season, in the first season. And we're, we're, I'm guess they're hoping there are going to be mul multiple seasons of the show. And Eminem has a cameo as White Boy Rick. Now, what I heard is that it's only like, you know, a scene or two. So it's going to be very brief. Um, so I don't know how much... You know uh, how much of his acting chops he's gonna actually have to exert for this if it's just you know a scene or two. Well, hopefully we can get him in like a recurring role at some point. But you know, Big Meech, BMF, fascinating group. Obviously, Flannery gets out at some point very soon. I think he had his well, um, you know his sentence uh, dropped a little bit recently. I think towards the early part of this yeah, year. But it's not. It's not very. The he the headlines made it seem like his release was imminent. Right. Um, unfortunately for him, uh, he's not the 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 sentence reduction took him down from coming out in 2032 to coming out in 2028. Right. Still it's a, still, it's still seven years. Yeah. It's his still, brother it's still got a lot of time. His brother, on the other hand, Southwest T Terry Flannery, who they call Southwest T, who was in on the same exact case, um, he walked out last year on a compassionate um release during covid uh so he came back to detroit right in the middle of covid and it was surreal man it was like this it was like this um like this exiled head of state was returning back to the homeland and, I, and this isn't an exaggeration you had a line around the door for or sorry a line around the block uh, for about two or three weeks of just luminaries, you know, underworld and hip hop luminaries from around the country descending on Detroit to to kiss Terry's ring. 
You had LL Cool J, Puffy, Fabulous, Nelly, um, 50 Cent. They were all coming in to like pay homage to Terry. This isn't even Meech. I mean, Meech is, is 10 times bigger than Terry. And, and 50 gave him a, uh, a Rolls Royce. You kind of envision when he comes home, it'll almost kind of be like how Bobby Shmurda, if you remember when Bobby came yeah. home, yeah. Uh, it seems like every rapper just took, you know, they got him home on a private jet and now he's yeah. you know, living luxury. When he comes home, it's going to be incredible. Now it's oh, a long well, way. And away. I think, you know, I'll take Demetrius at his word. Um, he's, you know, I've, I've spoken to him periodically over the last couple of years uh, from prison. And he's adamant that he wants to do a rebrand of, of BMF and, and turn it in, turn a negative into a positive and kind of restructure the narrative and, Good and try him. to, you know, give back to the community and, and do community outreach and, and um, you know, uh, anti-gang violence. And, 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 and we've heard that before, frankly, from a lot of people that, that are like Meech. I, I think Meech's sentiments to me, uh, I, I give a little bit more of the benefit of the doubt to Demetrius. He's never been a violent individual um, in terms of his organization. And it's pretty amazing that the organization grew to the size it grew and, and went, uh, you know, from one side of the country to the, to the other. And there was really no violence. There was no violence in the indictment that came down, which was the biggest um, DEA, the, the biggest domestic U.S. drug trafficking organization case in DEA history that came down in 05 um, called Operation Motor City Mafia. There wasn't one count of violence in there. So it shows you what, that kind of, kingpin statue. what a dip. And it's, it's just such an outlier. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's a true diplomat. Now, that's not to say he's never been implicated in violence. You know, I can sit here and tell you that the uh, DEA believes that he's, well, one, uh, he was involved in a, uh, a shooting that ended up with Puffy Combs' bodyguard, Anthony Wolf Jones, dead. Um, it was ruled self-defense, but Demetrius did shoot Wolf Jones. Um, and then there was a murder that took place right when Demetrius came to Atlanta from Detroit in 97 um, where a guy had came out of prison. He was a Detroiter that had been living down in Atlanta um, and came out of prison, went to a coming home party and on his way home from the coming home party uh, was killed in a drive by. Demetrius's name has been bandied about by law enforcement and that, but other than that, and I'm not, you know, I know that's that sounds like, you know, uh, in some, you know, these pieces of testimony sometimes here where he's like, you know, I've heard pieces of testimony where the guy's like, we were really good guys. We just killed people. But um, Demetrius, I, that's a, that's a, um, it's a very low number of suspected, uh, you know, violent acts for someone that has reached as big right. as he's gotten. So, so I, I take him at his word and I think that um, there will be a, it will be a big deal when he comes home. And I think that scares the quote unquote, the man, uh, anyone that is frankly, African-American and holds as much influence and sway over massive amounts of people like Demetrius does, frankly, I mean, that that's, that scares the government. Right. And we talked about that at length on your show about Larry Hoover, who, yeah, you know, is still in prison. He's not going to ever get out. I want to ask you, though, um, OC-wise, and we're talking with Scott Bernstein, great author, wrote Mafia Prince, and we're going to talk about Mafia Prince. I have a question on that. I'm going to talk about Jack Toko, a couple other things. So I don't know how much you know, but there's a YouTube community now with the Mafia. Uh, we have you know, Gene Borello and John A. Light and all these different people, and you know, Sammy mm -hmm. and Michael. There's a guy called Gunnar Lindblom on Twitter mm -hmm. or on YouTube. And I know you have a bit of, uh, uh, you know, Gunner a little bit. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts on Gunner? And I think there's always been a question of the validity of Gunner. Well, I mean, I can sit here and and, and I can vouch for his validity um, in terms of three things that I think are very important to the brand that he's trying to develop or build. And I, I don't really want to go past that. But what I can tell you is that he is a cousin 
of Jack Toko, who was the longtime godfather of the Detroit Mafia, um, whose whose own father, Black Bill Toko, was the one who founded the Detroit Mafia family back in 1931. Um, Gunner's grandpa uh, was first cousins with Jack Toko. So he does have a, a semi-close family re- relationship to the, to the Tokos of the Toko crime family. Um, he did 14 years in prison for some very, very serious criminal activity, uh, home invasions, armed robberies, extortions, drug dealing, and what have you. And he kept his mouth shut for almost 15 years. Um, was he a button guy? No. And I don't think he would tell you he was, he was a button guy. I mean, did he, was he a made member of the Detroit mafia? No. Was he anyone of really any significance in the Detroit mafia? Not really, but he was on the, you know, the low, low rung of guys that were in their at that time in their twenties that were the, the sons and grandsons and grand nephews of all the OGs. I don't really want to go beyond that, but I can say all, all that is all true. Great answer. And look, I think we can always have respect for the fact that he went to prison and didn't inform, which is a big problem, as we know. Well, especially um, if you're talking about this community that's online. Exactly. 99% right. of them right. are guys that are you know known right. rats. Right. Now, I, I, I want you to talk about – you wrote a book about Jack Toko. Is that correct? Well, I've written uh, – two books about the Detroit mafia and right, with him being the, the boss of the Detroit mafia. He, he clearly gets mentioned quite a bit in those books. You told me a story and, and I, I, th- I think this is for public consumption. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah. No problem. About the Barnes and Noble thing. Yeah. You Jack didn't love story about Jack Toko. Yeah. So Jack Toko, I, he, uh, he wasn't my biggest fan and I understand Jack Toko was someone that really took a lot of, pride and being viewed as this benevolent community leader and not a mafia boss, at least in terms of headlines and press and to just regular people in Detroit. He didn't want to be known as a mob don. He wanted the people in the mafia in Detroit to recognize him as a mob don (laughs) and kiss his ring. Um, But in terms of the general public, he was like, you know, the opposite of a John Gotti or an Al Capone or, or a Joey right. Merlino. Uh, and that's why he didn't go to prison really at all. Right. So he was, you know, and he had a, and he had a, a clean criminal record up until 1998. So he was pushing 70 before he took his first conviction. So he had some legs to stand on when he became the boss in the mid 70s. Well, he was acting boss in the mid 70s and then. He was inaugurated as the Godfather in the summer of 79 in an actual ceremony that the FBI was there taking pictures of. Um, But, you know, he was very litigious and he would uh, sue any media companies, newspapers, magazines, television broadcasts that referred to him as a member of the mafia or as a criminal at all, as a any type of criminal because he had no criminal record. In fact, right. he had a business degree uh, from the University of Detroit, and he ran a number of very successful legitimate businesses. So he really bristled at the notion of being a mafia don. And then kind of him being convicted back in 98 and then going to prison. When he came out of prison, he did a very short sentence, and there was a lot of questions about why that sentence was so short. But uh, did you know less than two years, came out, and at that point, it was right after 9-11, and the Detroit mob, both, both in the press and with the FBI, really became a kind of a non-priority. So he was, you know, he had a good decade of no one really saying his name. And then Scott Bernstein comes on the scene as this 28-year-old, 29-year-old Jewish kid from the west side of Detroit all the Italians live on the east side of Detroit. So, you know, they didn't really know who I was. And I start putting him on blast again, uh, letting everyone know who he is, putting his picture out there, putting his dad's 
picture out there, put his brother's picture out there. And he didn't like it. And again, I mean, I'm not, my job isn't to make friends. It's, as long as I'm reporting accurately and reporting truthfully, you know, I, I'm, I'm comfortable in, in, right. in my order of operation and my protocol. But so getting to what you were talking about. So when my first book came out, had a picture of, of Jack Toko's dad on it. Um, Black Bill Toko had a picture of him from a Senate hearing in the 1950s. And uh, he was really upset. Well, there was pictures of him inside the book, but he was upset that the cover was his dad. Um, and he went on like a he went on a grassroots campaign across Metro Detroit to try to kind of, I guess, stifle the word of mouth about the book. So first, the, there were two things. One I told you about, and one I don't think I did that I'll follow up with. So. The first one was, so my book came out like October-ish uh, of seven. So by in Christmas of seven, he, he grabbed all of his grandchildren and great-grandchildren and nephews, and he gathered them in his den, and he told them to disperse to all the Barnes and & Nobles and Borders bookstores around Metro Detroit. And not to steal my book, but to hide my book. And he wanted to, you know, prevent me from getting Christmas traffic uh, or Christmas sales. And he's like, "Go take that book and stick it, you know, in the behind gardening, the, the gardening section, or behind all the other books." So I, I got that uh, relayed to me by some people that were actually at that get together where he where he, <laughs> where he relayed those orders. And then there's this other place. That's one of my all-time favorite places in Detroit. It's called Bomberitos. It's a bakery. Uh, best sandwiches in the world. Place has been around since, you know, every city's got them. Place has been around since the 1910s. Um, it's just it's just a, a uh, just one of the great traditions of Detroit is Bomberitos Bakery. And I've, all, I've been going there for a long time, and they have... Uh, because it's so popular, a lot of times you got to wait to check out. And while you're waiting, they got kind of shelves of, of little things that you can buy, little trinkets. And for the first couple of years that my book was out, they were selling my book. And then I went in there one day and the, the book wasn't out for sale anymore. So I went up to the counter. I didn't tell them who I was or anything. I was just like, yeah, you guys usually you have that Motor City Mafia book. Every time I come in here, I like looking at it. And they're like, yeah, you know, a lot of our our, our uh, patrons really enjoyed it. But, you know, we have this one guy whose family has been a big part of this bakery dating back, <laughs> you know, 75 years. And his dad's on the cover of that book. And he asked us if we would remove it. So we did. And I said, was his name Jack Toko? And they're like, yes. How do you know? Do you know Mr. Toko? And I was like, oh, I kind of know him a little bit. <laughs> That's funny. So he tried to stifle your book sales by doing it organically and getting it out. That's funny. But uh, you know, it's I, I've I've been on some over the years. I was on some uh, panels and talk shows locally with his with his attorney. Um, I never met Jack. Uh, I never met him in person. Never had a chance to get face to face with him. Um, but uh, you know, he he is. No, I, I I guess the one thing that it, I, I guess it's no consolation for someone like Jack Toko, but. What I, was always, what I would always say or what I do always say to his relatives who I talk to that will tell me how much Jack didn't like me. That he hated I like, you. I was like, yeah, but, you know, I always, I, I've always written with great reverence. Like, I've always, you know, my narrative has been very, like, this guy is the Harvard of my bosses. He's the Cadillac of my bosses. Like, I've always been right. very, like, um, praiseworthy of his criminality. I'm not out there telling everyone they know it's like he's, you know, he's a bumbling, fumbling idiot. I guess it doesn't no, matter to him. It, has no, it doesn't matter to him. But I guess to me, I was like, well, at least he can acknowledge that I'm, you know, propping him up as a, as a criminal. Right. He was on, I mean, he's on the legend of, of any great boss, whether it's a Cardo or Salerno. Yeah. I mean, that Salerno wasn't the, the, the boss, but you know what I'm saying? He's kind of on that other level over other he guys. Detroit had this, because the, the, the family is so interwoven genetically. Uh, 
you know, you had a boss that lasted 40 years before Jack Toko, his uncle, Joe Zerilli, uh, who was on the commission, never did a day in jail. Uh, and then you follow up that 40 year run with another 40 year run. And it's only two years of prison time. So that's 80 years with two bosses yeah. and less than two years of prison time. So it's, it's crazy. It's an, it's an anomaly. Well, now, obviously, this question I'm going to ask you is a long winded one, and I don't need you to go into your, you know, we, we don't need to do a whole hour on, on this exact question. But I want you to answer this in 10 words or less, if you can do that. I know that's tough for you. If you can do <laughs> that. Who killed Jimmy Hoffman? 10 words or less. Um, 20. I, I'll say that I think, Jimmy I think you, I'm, I'm certain. As certain as certain can be without actually having proof that it was the Jackaloni brothers crew and that the members of the hit team were a, a kind of a, a cross section of Jackaloni crew members in the Detroit mafia. And then Genovese, Genovese crime family members that spawned from the Provenzano crew. Um, and I believe they came, they came together and carried out the job and then disposed of the body rather quickly. Now, let me ask you, I've always had a belief that the body was probably disposed like they did in the Irishman where they right, had that's the one that, and, Right. I got, I have some ish, issues with historical accuracy. The Irishman, as much as I love the movie, because sure. I mean, who, who couldn't love Martin Scorsese and the, the subject matter. I think he takes a, you know, a couple uh, liberties with, with some facts, but, the one thing that I am in lockstep with that uh, that one theory is that they show you that he was taken and incinerated uh, probably within a half hour, if not less, of, of him um, breathing his last breath. And I'm I make pretty the joke, confident Scott. in that that was that's his final resting place. And this running around looking for a body for 45 years is just a giant wild goose chase. Well, I make the joke that he could be on someone's mantle somewhere, ashes in an urn. Ashes, yeah, you know? right. Like he's literally on a mantle in some nice house somewhere. Who the hell knows? So the, the one thing, I, the one specific I can I can give some insight to uh, regarding where I think he ended up. Um, and Sheeran didn't name a specific place, but he did say a crematorium that the mob had ownership and access to. Uh, so the Detroit mob, just like a lot of um, mafia families around the country have traditionally had a, a big stake in sanitation. Um, Detroit mob figures owned the two biggest sanitation companies in Detroit at that time, Tri-County and Central Sanitation. Central Sanitation is where I believe he was taken. Uh, Central Sanitation was owned by two OG Detroit mob figures at the time. They're, they're long dead now, uh, but a uh, uh, Bazi Vitali, Peter Vitali, who they call Bazi, and Rafael Quasarano, who they called uh, Jimmy the Jimmy the Goon or Jimmy Q, and uh, they would always traditionally they would act as go betweens between Detroit and New York because Quasarano did a lot of Jimmy Quasarano did a lot of work with the New York uh, mob, and they own Central Sanitation. So first we know for a fact that. Three or four days after Hoffa disappeared, FBI agents followed Vitali and Quasarano from Detroit to New York to the Palma Boy Social Club, uh, where they met with Tony Salerno. Interesting. Uh, and then went and had dinner at a restaurant called Vesuvio, um, which was on 48th Street, I think. I'm not positive. But it was like an old school uh, or maybe 148th Street. Um, in Harlem. Old, old, old school Italian place. Yeah, hey, I think it was 148th Street. Um, and there was like a dinner of members, a couple members of different families and the Detroit guys. It all happened in about a 48-hour period. And I believe, and the FBI believes, that, that those sets of meetings were Zerilli, wow. Toco, and Giacalone sending by Italian Quasarano to New York to give updates to the commission. Right. What that it makes happened. sense. Makes yeah. sense. And then 
fast forward about uh, eight months later after that, Central Sanitation burns down in an arson fire. The FBI had been trying to get in there with a search warrant. Um, and the arson fire destroyed any evidence that they might have been able to get in there and get. We'll never know. But, you know, it was like it wasn't like five years later or 10 years later. It was like within a year that place burned down. And it wasn't a that coincidence seems, that it burned down. Yeah, that seems coincidental. <laughs> yeah. A uh, couple comments here. I do want to shout out uh, the listeners. Thanks for checking us out. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. I do want to send a special shout out. You'll get a kick out of this, Scott. Uh, Marie Sorelli's in the chat. You recognize that last name, Sorelli. Uh, I believe her uncle ran uh, the Ravenite Social Club, as far as I know. Oh. Uh, so they were they were descendants of that group. She talked about on another channel, Sicilian Fat Paul Sicilian's channel. She talked about kind of her life growing up and seeing those guys around. And I actually had a question for her. I wanted to ask her about Joe the Cat Lafort. Yeah, so was believe- Joe the Cat. Joe the Cat was her grandpa. Yeah, I want to ask about that. Joe Joe Cat Lafort was the owner of the Raven. I owned a lot of real estate in that he area. Owned the pro- he owned the the property that the Raven building, was in. right? And Mrs. Sorelli and Michael Sorelli lived uh, well, up lived there. Up and then, top. Yeah, and then Sorelli died, and she kind of lived there. And she was yeah, the yeah, one and then that she went to Florida, and they went in yeah, there. And- oh, exactly. You know, yeah, yeah. So I'd love to know about that, Marie, if if you know offhand. Um, a lot of questions about Gunner in here. Uh, I think people kind of understand. He's such a lightning now. rod. He really is. He really is. Now, you wrote Mafia Prince, which is Philip Leonetti's book about his uncle, Nicky Scarfo. You actually came on my show, The Sit Down. We talked about Nicky at length. And I presented a question to you, and I think you were surprised by it. Why the hell didn't Salvi and Philip kill Nicky? Well, I think that Philip was headed in that direction. Uh, I think if they had not. If they had not had been indicted and arrested, or this is what Phil told me, the, the indictment came down in March of 87. He said uh, he had been in Florida um, and Nikki had been in Florida right when the indictment was was uh, either about to come down or I think they might have arrested Nikki in Florida and Phil was back in uh, Jersey or, or Philadelphia for a couple days. But they had spent a lot of time down in Florida. He told me that if that indictment hadn't come down, that his uncle wouldn't have lasted the spring. That wow. he had planned whether or not he had people behind him or not, that he was going to kill his uncle and whether or not he was going to leave the life at that point or take over the family for himself. Um, but, you know, he was pretty adamant that if they hadn't been arrested, that's, that was what was going to happen. And then he also talks about in the book how Scarfo thought Leonetti was going to get out on bond. And instructed Scarfo to go kill his wife. This is the hmm. first Philip to go kill Scarfo's wife. Right. Hmm. I mean, that's how demented a guy Nicky Scarfo was. Yeah, I don't think anyone will disagree with you there. He was a complete psychopath. Let me ask you: Salvi doesn't get killed. Let's see, they killed Nicky. You look at Philadelphia because really after Angelo Bruno, it was a shit show, right? The Scarfo era was a mess. The eighties were nutty around here. Uh, then you had the John Stanford nonsense. He was an, a lunatic. By the way, speaking of, you mentioned about Jack Toko. You, you know, you, you never really worried that he was going to do anything to you. Remember around here, John Stanfa I know, talked about killing multiple news reporters. Yeah, George Anastasia Anastasia and, and Geraldo Rivera. Yeah, he said he told. I believe it, who was it? It was the Sicilian that worked for him, the direct Sicilian that worked yeah, for him. Yeah, Bel- Bel- Rosario Bellocchio. Right. He instructed him to throw grenades into George Anastasia's home. Yeah. Uh, he hated journalists, but you know, he was a complete mess. And then the Ralph Natali nonsense, and then obviously into the current regimes that we see over the last, let's say, 10, 20 years. What what would have the lineage looked like with Salvi as boss? Because I got a feeling he'd have been a boss for a long time. A lot I, think of was, I think I actually think it's a two-part thing. I think if Salvi would have maintained his relationship with Maria Mer- uh, Maria Merlino right and would have right. married would have married Joey Merlino's sister Chucky Merlino's daughter uh which would have solidified those bonds even you know even f- deeper and further um and it, had he not been murdered and he had not and he had let's assume he wasn't 
brought down in the indictment that takes down Bill and Nikki. Yeah, then Salvi's the boss in the 90s. And you would think that none of those crazy factional disputes where you had brothers trying to kill brothers, um, which is really sad. I mean, people use the word tragic too often. And, and I, I don't often like using the word tragic when it comes to organized crime because a lot of these, most of these guys, if not all of these guys, they know the, they know the, the stakes that, that, they're, that they're playing. They know the game that they're playing and, and death goes along with that. But to have what you had in Philadelphia in, in the Changalini family where you had three brothers on the, uh, well, three brothers on the street to start a father away in prison. And the, the middle brother goes to prison too, who was the, the kind of the, the level headed one. Mm-hmm. And you got the, the the two other ones that that didn't like each other, kind of to start from some sibling rivalries, opposite teams. And then the world. next thing you know, they're on opposite sides of a war, and they're literally Crazy. killing each other. Yeah, brother versus brother, as they. And say. Yeah. it's just like I can't imagine Chicky Changalini, who is the dad, sitting in prison. And, and I think uh, I don't want to say I'm proud of myself, but one of the things that I am, um, I guess I'm proud of reporting. Uh, in my reporting that I was able to report based on um, my talks with, with Ralph Natale, uh, Phil Leonetti, uh, a number of other guys that give me information, that it was a false narrative that was coming out at the time. The, the narrative that was coming out at the time was that Chicky was backing the power play, that Chicky was backing Mikey Chang against Joey Chang hmm. and well, uh, and that Chicky and Chucky, the fathers of Mikey Chang and Joey Merlino were somehow coaching from behind bars, hmm. their two sons. And, uh, and that just couldn't be further from the truth. Now, Ralph Natale was definitely doing some coaching, if you will, from behind bars, trying to use Merlino and, and his crew as muscle to take, take the family over. But from talking to multiple people, that narrative that had kind of got out in the 90s, you know, again, couldn't be further from the truth. Chicky was telling everyone, stand down. Chicky was telling everyone, just just stop. And was telling Joey and, and Mikey Chang to, you know, you know, look, kind of like what you saw in, in Gotti. I know we're a big fan of that movie. Yeah. And we're, we're a, uh, where Neil Della Croce tells John Gotti, like, whether I like it or not, these are the rules. You just gotta stand. This down is La Cosa right. Nostra, right, right, right. And I, that's what Ch- that's what Ch- Chicky was saying. Not that he loved John Stampa, but he was basically saying that New York put him in. Yeah, he's the boss. Take it easy. Right. It makes and sense. Johnny, right. And then Johnny was but away. As we know, they don't follow the rules a lot of the time. Right. Some of you know, and we can go back to Carlo Gambino killed to become the boss at one point. So right. rules are meant to be broken. Yeah. Uh, I got a question here. Someone's been mentioning this a couple of times. I feel like I want to bring it up. I don't know if I'm getting into a weird thing here. Scott, I'm trying to reach you. Chicky from Springfield wants you to write his book. How do I reach you? Uh, I've talked to people that are uh, – tell whoever's saying that, tell them I'm in touch with Chicky's attorney. There you go. So I think there – it may be in the works, maybe won't be in yeah. the works. I don't, yeah. I don't know if I'll commit to writing his book. I'd definitely be interested in uh, talking to Chicky. Uh, I, I love that whole Springfield mafia story. If that, if Springfield was, if you took that same exact story, the same exact characters, and it's very Philadelphia like in terms of the soap opera aspect of the mafia in Springfield. But people think it's such a tiny town, and uh, you know, a lot of power there. They're, they're connected. Boston. But that is as interesting, as fascinating, as historically significant. Is any crime family, uh, any you know, crime faction uh, in organized crime in the last forty years, um, and they are a part of the Genovese crime family, even though they are in Massachusetts, and a lot of power um, that spreads across New England. And yeah, you know, Chicky was in. Ch- this we're now, now we're talking about a different Chicky. We were talking yeah. about Chicky Changalini. Now we're Chicky. talking about Chicky Chechatelli or Fat Chicky Chechatelli. Um, who was really there at the last, the last time that that Springfield was a, a real commodity 
um, was in the you know the two thousands. Uh, in the last ten years, it's it's been a, a, a kind of a fading uh, fading operation. But but Chicky was a big bookmaker uh, for Big Al Bruno and Benji Arlotta, who were you know big deals. Yeah, I want to ask you about Springfield real quick. Arlotta Ar- actually did an interview recently. It was actually decent on on Vlad TV. But I wanted to ask you about Freddie Gias, who ac- yep. according to I don't really know. According to who, uh, most people believe he killed Whitey Bulger in federal prison. Now he's not been charged. Okay, right. it's it's been three years now. Fodius Gia in the hole. Not, say that again. He's been in the hole for three years. No, I know. And what I'm saying is, let, and keep the, this is how the United States government works. Fodius Gias has never been charged with killing Whitey Bulger. Okay, whether he did or he didn't, he's not been charged. With it. He's not been given a fair trial. He, he's really being kept under solitary confinement for three years. What is his state of mind? He's got to be pissed off at this point. I mean, he's either he's, give him charges or don't. This guy is, uh, you know, when you want to talk about a throwback, he ain't Italian, but he's as throwback to the, you know, the OG Italians from the, the start of this whole thing. Right. You know, right. he's as La Cosa Nostra as any made Italian mafia member in the country. Freddie Gias is. That's what, you know, that, that's how much the code means to him. And I've never met Freddie, but I've talked to a lot of people that are yeah. friends, uh, relatives, Benji and whatnot. Um, but for Freddie, I, what, what I think, he, you're not going to break Freddie. No. You know, uh, Freddie, if, and I don't know what the end game is. There's a lot more than meets the eye with the with the Whitey Bulger thing, you know. Again, we could we could spend a whole hour talking about. We feel like he probably knew too much. There's no, there's no way that that was not an inside job of some sort. Sure. Uh, there were a lot of people in the federal government that were compromised. Frankly, I believe if if Whitey Bulger wanted to tell the whole story, right? Um, and just everything about the way that, that his murder took place you know he's he's moved from a a like a, a, a mid security prison in Florida into a super you know almost the equivalent of a supermax in West Virginia where everybody from Boston and Massachusetts goes and he's put into gen pop it's one of the weirdest and again i i think you're so right here it is truly an inside job. There's no way that Gias gets into the same corridor as 80, what, 88 year old Whitey Bulger, and he's just sitting there within hours, within like six hours of him hitting the compound. Yeah, it's, it's, and and again, the, the, the feds work in, and a lot of people don't really understand this, but the feds have multiple system and tiers of level of security. All due respect to Whitey. Look, was he on the run for 16 years? Yeah. Was he a dangerous guy in his his his, his era? Yeah. But the guy should have been at Devon's or he was like in a wheelchair. He was in yeah. a wheelchair. He was 87 years old. If I'm the Bulger, and I I know they did sue the BOP, they should have. I mean, that is the biggest, most wildest conspiracy theory in the federal prison ever. I- it it goes up there with the Jeffrey Epstein stuff. I mean, it really does. And again, here, Scott, the thing is, and I know people are going to say, "Who gives a fuck?" Whitey Bulger is a piece of shit. You're right, but he's still a human being that in this country has certain rights. Okay, so you can't just throw him wherever the fuck you want. Every other prisoner is afforded a tier system, and I know he's a dangerous guy, but there's a lot of dangerous guys that are. At, John Gotti was at Springfield. He was a dangerous guy. You know, and I'll say that I was this guy in Hazleton. And I got no problem saying it's complete and utter bullshit that they're holding Freddie. And I called D. Calagero is the other one who's another Boston guy. They're the two guys that they're claiming beat Whitey to death. They've been sitting in the shoe, which is another expression for uh, you know, the hole or you know, uh, maximum security uh, lockdown for three years. They haven't charged him. That's bullshit. Either charge him or send him back to Gen Pop. That's my thing. And it's yeah. like, you know, again, he is a convicted murderer. He's never getting out. He's going to yeah. spend his life in Hazleton. But, again, we can't just unnecessarily hold people in, you know, people can't survive. For, world country type shit. 
Yeah, that's like shit they did in like you know Gestapo's and stuff. Yeah, like, but it also makes me think that like that there's that it's more than just we're trying to punish him for killing Whitey. It's like we're trying to break him, uh, you know, break his spirit to the point where he won't tell the world who tipped him off. It's like they're worried that. The killing Ruby to keep from yes, right, Harvey Oswald, right. Girl, that's a good I, point. Just, that's yeah. a good point. I, I, but yeah, it, yeah it's, it's 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 weird, weird and it's and it's wrong. And I don't know what uh, Freddie's family's doing right now. I, I've had some conversations uh, with some people that are tied to his family. I know he's got a daughter that cares about him very much, and um, it, it, that's just that's it's cruel and unusual punishment. Whether or not he he's a murderer or not, um, it, it, it's unnecessary. Yeah, it's it's really cruel and unusual punishment at this point. Either just like it's unnecessary, right? Just like it's unnecessary. We've talked about guys that are in supermaxes that don't need to be in supermaxes. Oh, Joey yeah. the Clown Lombardo was uh, a yeah. he was eighty nine years old. I mean, he doesn't need to be in supermax. Now, I've said before, I mean, you look at Larry Hoover. I mean, Larry Hoover is is an old man. Larry Hoover doesn't have get any – no one does his bidding anymore. I mean, what's he in Supermax for? Uh, but, again, people look at it and say, well, we don't really care. They're criminals, and they're some of the worst criminals. Well, I think, the, think, diff- I really think the, the difference is – and we did touch on this when we talked about Hoover on, on, on original Gangsters podcast – is that Hoover, like Demetrius Plenary – whether or not they are still criminals or former criminals, their word echoes loudly and echoes around the country. And that, that's, that scares the government. Joey Lombardo, he did, he was, even, even if you wanted to make the argument that he was controlling the outfit from prison, which he wasn't, that, that's still like what uh, 20 made guys 25 made guys as opposed to meach and larry who whose word holds weight with dare i say hundreds of thousands if not millions so True. i think with hoover and meach i'm not i'm not i don't agree with it i don't think larry hoover deserves to be in a supermax but i i think i'm under i think i'm trying to explain the the mindset of the government but with some of these other guys like I'm like we're talking about Joey Lombardo. I know Jimmy Marcello, who's another Chicago guy who's in Supermax. Uh and I'm just there's no need for those guys to be in Supermax. No. It's that should be for, for terrorists, witness tampers, right. super kill guards. Cabani like, Savage deserves right. to be in Supermax. No, Cabani should never leave ADX for sure. And he's put himself there for a reason. Um so we'll keep you a few more minutes. Uh love talking to you. Scott Bernstein, check him out. I love, it. I love uh, doing this. Original Gangsters podcast. You can find it wherever you get your podcast. Um, I love what you're doing, dude. I know so we can you. spend so much time, uh, you know, shining each other up. But I love what you're doing, and we need more people like the Jeff Nadus of the world that don't only that not only, you know, it's a it's a labor of love, and he's obviously great at what he does in terms of uh, his gambling picks and everything. But he, you know, your stuff, man, and. And you're, it's, it, it comes across, the authenticity comes across, the due diligence comes across. And I, I wish I could say that about more people in the space, because there's a lot of people that have been at it a lot longer than you that haven't figured that stuff out yet. And Thank you, you. you figured it out right off the bat and your, your product uh, screams authenticity. Thank you. And I, I, I think I could sit here and talk to you forever about this kind of stuff. And I, I, you know, I love your content. I love what you're doing. You have the gangster report as well. Listen, I want to tell everybody out there, go check the gangster report out. If you want gangster news on everything. So recently, this is a story that went out yesterday. Stephen Fleming, no compassionate release, not going to get out of prison, which good. He shouldn't. Yeah, uh, he's not a piece surprising. of shit. Um, Stephen Fleming's 89 years old. He's not going to get out. Um, it's just that simple. He uh, didn't get I mean, this was Whitey Bulger and Stevie Flemmy. You know, there are gangsters and there are bad guys and there are criminals. And then there are evil, deplorable miscreants 
Um, and Whitey Bulger and Stevie Filming weren't just badass gangsters who, who killed other gangsters. They preyed on young women and, and young boys in the neighborhood. Yeah. They, uh, well, at least Whitey, I can say, you know, uh, was, was raping young boys and girls. These are bad people. They shouldn't yeah, Stevie be out of killed, Stevie yeah. killed two of his two of his girlfriends. One of those girlfriends was his stepdaughter. Yes, choked. Uh, yeah. So, the notion that he could even be up for a compassionate release was surprising to me. I do believe Hawk was uh, denied as well. Hawk uh, Carbonaro. Hawk uh, Carbonaro. Uh, Carbonaro. Which to me, yeah. though, I mean, letting a guy like Huck out or letting a guy like Frankie Loke out. Yeah, uh, Frankie Locasio. Well, I, I don't do respect Frankie Loke still being locked up is pathetic. I mean, it, but it did, but it, why? No, I'm, I'm no, I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying what? What's the point of having a guy like that locked up right now? I, dudes, well, eighty listen, some years. It's a waste of that, the, a waste of resources. I've made the case that if you don't, this could, and I want to say this, and I I don't want people to take it the wrong way. Unless you commit murder or really terrible sexual abuse, that kind of stuff. Like if you're in, you should not be in prison for life for, for Ponzi schemes. Sorry. With Frankie, with Frankie Loke or, or, or this, mob stuff. Like you shouldn't. I, I, it's it's kind of dovetails with some of the stuff I'm talking about uh, in the last, you know, 45 minutes or whatever, when we're talking about, you know, hard ons the government gets for people, but Frankie Loke, you know, it, it, it all had to do with who his co-defendant was. If he's not, of course, you know, if he's not indicted with Gotti, and he's not Gotti's underboss, I bet he's home five, ten years ago. I mean, you look at Gene for prime example, his brother. I'm yeah. surprised he ever got out of jail. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm surprised the feds aren't going to do something to put him back in. Uh, we've seen what's happened with the son. I mean, we we've seen all that stuff. Um, I want to ask you and. When, when I do YouTube shows, YouTube's a little different than any other medium. You, you obviously have people on YouTube now that you they don't want to stay in the middle. I always kind of stay in the middle. I don't side with anyone. I just kind of speak the facts kind of like you do. There are a lot of rats on YouTube now, as we know. I said that earlier. Where do you land? And this is a question that is asked. Where do you land on Junior? On Junior Gotti? Yeah. Um, are, are we talking about if he cooperated or not? Yeah. I don't really know how you could, I, all due respect to Junior Gotti, I don't know how you can really debate it. And I'm not a John A. Light fan and I'm not saying anything against John yeah. A. Light. I'm not, I'm just saying I'm not, I'm not trying to carry his water for him. Right, and we're not. Uh, and, and again, but, I want to say one thing: we, I've never carried the water for John A. Light. I'm yeah. not going to carry the water for anyone. I'm not in that business. I'm in but the I've business seen, of, you know, I've seen three o twos. Unless those three o twos are doctored, right? Which they could be. He, yeah, which they could be. But it it looks like he debriefed, and nothing ever came of it. He never actually testified against anyone. And this is where you know there's some gray area. Uh, that I've actually, there's some nuance to w what is considered a rat. Um, there are guys that, you know, can rationalize or, or in some cases, maybe legitimately rationalize others that try to kind of play mental gymnastics and convince themselves of things that aren't true. Um, but so I, I don't know what, I don't know what you would consider that. He never testified in open court. Uh, he wasn't giving information uh, while he was an active member right. of organized crime, but he did have some, some form of proffer session where he gave up stuff that he knew about crimes. And I think there were some murders there and, and pointing fingers at some people. Um, so if you, if you consider that, it, so I guess, it, so what are we defining as a rat? And I'm not saying I know, but is it I get up on the stand and point my finger at someone or is it I had any interaction at any time in my career with the government? Right. And let's be real. I mean, John went on, what, five trials? Yeah, I think four and they were going to go for a fifth and they stopped. 
And we know that I don't think anyone will ever disagree with this, no matter if you like them or you don't. The FBI has had a vendetta against that family since yeah. the 60s, probably. So is it out of the question to think there could be doctored? Sure. But I've said before, okay, and again, I work in what I know. If you actually look at Whitey Bulger and the information he provided, we can make the case that he's not a big a rat as people say he is. Well, he was playing the FBI. The FBI wasn't playing him. Right. Right. Exactly. Now, again, a rat is a rat in most instances. And there's a lot of cases where, like, you know, where you might say, well, I don't know if that's a rat. But um, at the end of the day, Junior is a lot like Franzese. You know Franzese's story, right? Yeah. Did he cooperate? Did he cooperate against one or two guys well, that weren't in the mob? Yeah. Well, I think there's less clear evidence in Francis's case. I mean, I've never seen a 302. Like well, I've he seen... testified against guys that weren't in the life, Norby yeah. Walters and people like that. But Right. And, and uh, I, I doubt that he would have been able to finagle his way out of his case. And when I say finagle, I mean, he still – he clearly had to still – Pay a debt, right? Um, but I, I, did it, there? There, I think there was some wheeling and dealing behind the scenes. I don't think he was giving up the Colombo crime family or his dad. Sure, no, I agree with you. But Two I got questions. nothing. But, I got nothing but mad props for what Mike Francis has been able to do with his life in the last twenty years. I mean, he's turned himself into a franchise, and he's smart and he's articulate. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I have a lot of respect for what he's done after he left the life. Agreed. I, I mean, uh, I think if you're going to map out a post mob existence existence for a previous mob figure, I mean, I think he, he kind of has the blueprint right now. There's a lot of people that are trying to copy it and, and it, it just, it, it's, well, it's, no, seems- I mean, yeah. Him and Sammy are doing a lot of numbers right. on both right. ends. Let me ask you two questions for you. Um, one has to do with Philadelphia, and, and I feel like I can answer this as well, and I think you'll agree with me. Someone asked, was the Black Mafia scared of the Italians, and were they going to ever not operate? The truth is, no. The Philadelphia Black Mafia couldn't have given a fuck about anybody in South Philly. Well, and they worked, fact, they worked together. They weren't ad- They weren't adversarial. But again, we have to ask ourselves, I don't know if that's true, though. Did they work together? I think so. Of course they did. I'm sure Angelo Bruno went into the black bottom and got well, well, long, John, long John Moderano was doing a lot of work. Right. But let me ask you, Dubrow's Furniture Store was on 4th and South, I believe. That's right in South Philly. Okay? Right. And I don't know, but people have to know that Nudie Mims and other individuals in the black mafia went in there. And did what they fucking wanted to wanted do. to do, right? They didn't give a shit about what Angelo Bruno thought. Right. And I'm and gonna also, tell you right now, if you put them up against Philadelphia, it wouldn't have been a fucking question. The Black Mafia was very powerful, and they weren't scared of anyone, and they were more lethal. They were more ruthless. They were more ruthless, especially uh, especially when you're talking about the the Bruno era. Um, sure, I I fully concur with the notion that at the height of the Black Brothers Inc. or the Philadelphia Black Mafia family, whether or not they were copacetic with the Italians, really played no role or had no was no factor. Didn't matter. And I think they were on good terms with the Italians, but whether or not they were or they weren't, it didn't matter. Was, was in of of no consequence because, like you said, these guys were were, were marching to the beat of their own drummer. And like you said, what Angelo Bruno did or didn't say had no effect on what Sam Christian or Ron Harvey uh, or, or Bo Baines or any of those guys was going to do. Listen, the truth of the matter is the three most dangerous people in the history of this state are Sam Christian, Ron Harvey, and Kabani Savage. Nice. And they're all direct descendants of the same grouping of people, whether it was the JBM, whether it was the Black Mafia, whether it was Kabani's organization – all extremely dangerous, and they put the Philly group to fucking bed. What I um, will, what I will say though, is not so much the original Black Brothers Inc., but when you get into JBM, 
and you get into the 90s, I believe there was an affinity in some ways of the JBM guys towards Joey and his guys. Well, yeah, and if you know anything about the Joey JBM, school. they centered their family or what they thought was their family around mafia ethics. They had yeah. a governing board. Aaron Jones was the top boss, if you will. And look, if you know anything about Ram Squad, Tommy Hill, they loved Joey. Mm-hmm. So, and they were all kind of, you know, looking up to those guys. Let me ask you, and I don't want to keep you forever. I know you got a, a life. Um, let me ask you, you got to pick one money guy, one enforcer, and one boss from history. Who's your three? Well, Meyer Lance, he's going to be the money guy because great answer. No, nobody had in mind for, for criminal finances like. Well, let Meyer. me ask you. I'm curious. Let's say you can't pick Meyer. Who are you picking? That, that's what I want to know. I can't pick Meyer. Jimmy Burke, the money guy. Well, you know, I would say there's a Salerno. I'll put in a sleeper. Uh, there was a guy in Chicago named Hyman Larner, who they called Red, mm-hmm. um, who everyone described as the Meyer Lansky of Chicago. And he was this very, very shadowy figure that there are very few pictures of, but he was working closely with Accardo and Giancana. A lot of and he guys was, like that, He yeah. was taking a lot of their money and, and putting it <laughs> offshore, like putting stuff offshore before anyone was putting money offshore. So I'll 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 be a little uh, mafia snobbish and and go with a kind of a niche guy that maybe you haven't heard of unless you're a, a, a Chicago mob nerd. I'm it's Tony Salerno. I, there's no other answer to me, but I, I can understand Myers well, and I do understand Lerner. Who's your enforcer? Who do you want to? Well, kill? I'm, I'm biased because I'm a Detroiter. I'm going to go with Tony Jacaloni, scariest mob figure probably in the history of Detroit. That guy could cut glass with a stare. Um. And he enjoyed it. He liked it. He he, he enjoyed scaring people. And um, the picture of him in the with the Detroit uh, in the police station. Yeah, that's my yeah, that's my photo right from seventy. And that's incredible. that photo is like a month before he killed Hoffa. It's like May of seventy five. It's incredible. Um, it's incredible. But I'll give a quick, not personal, but personal for my family. My dad and my grandpa uh, were golfing with Tony Jacaloni back in the seventies. My grandpa was um, not a mob guy, but hung around with a lot of Jewish organized crime figures. And my grandpa was a great golfer. Uh, Jack Toko, back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, owned a country club, a golf club called Hillcrest. My grandpa was the club champion at Hillcrest, and that was where all the wise guys would golf every day. Uh, so they all liked to golf with my grandpa because my grandpa, they would be- they would take him. They'd stake my grandpa and they'd bet him. So my dad is like 22 years old, like right out of law school. We're going into law school. Uh, my my grandpa, Tony Jacaloni, and Tony Jacaloni's uh, bodyguard, this guy named Ronnie Morelli. And they were teeing off. And I guess Tony was taking a little too long to tee off. And these guys behind him didn't realize who they were barking at. And they were. <laughs> They were yelling at him, and the next thing you know, uh, Tony Giacalone and, and Ronnie Morelli uh, both took nine irons and wrapped it around this guy's head <laughs> and looked at my dad and my grandpa and said, you didn't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And my dad has always told that story to uh, to kind of exemplify the point, you know, think twice before you open your mouth to people because you never know who you're opening your mouth you never to. who you're talking to you never knew who that old guy is uh at, yeah there, real quick there's a story i heard about a guy i don't know if you've ever heard of this guy he was in the genovese family his name was chinky Facciano. he was, he was i a, didn't know a lot about him except that he was like a hundred yeah he was a real it was a real old school guy like he had been in the life for like 70 years never got above soldier but he made a lot of money uh, and he banished him down to Florida to do work down in Florida. And he was trying to do mob bits at like 90. This right, guy was got him on, he got him on tape, like talking about the best way to kill people. Yeah, he's like, if you ever need someone killed, I got, I'll got, i do it. And they said, well, we want to leave that to the younger guys. But there's a story one time. He was at Gulfstream Park, the, the horse uh, yeah. spot. And this guy in a wheelchair bumped him. And the guy goes, watch where you're going. And Chinky looks at him and goes, you watch where the fuck you're going. And walk, and I think the guy made a comment and said, "Like, if I would have known who that guy was at the time, 
Like he was just a little geriatric looking yeah. guy. Well, it's like but the this- dude. I've seen you tweet this out before, and uh, the those scenes in The Sopranos with Junior trying oh, to yeah. act like the mob boss of the yeah. uh, retirement home was kind yeah. of based on this yeah. Harry Konisberg uh, KO. KO Konisberg, who, yeah. Who was this? Was like ten years ago. Yep. Yeah. Uh, or no, maybe it was, well, it was at some point in the last decade or two. It was similar. And, he was like threatening. And he people. was beat. He was like extorting <laughs> members of the retirement home and like beating yeah. them up. This like ninety year old. Yeah, yeah. Guy. No, it it reminded me the Facciano thing. Reminded me of the Bill, Bobby Bacala Senior episode Sopranos, yeah. where he yep. he has to kill that Mustang Sally character. Yep. Um. One and other question. Bo- bo- a boss. I'll, I'll I'll give Tony Accardo. I mean, to me, yeah. he's. Probably the, the greatest Mafia Don of all time. Uh, Carlo Gambino can definitely be up there, but uh, Gambino's run was 20 years. Uh, Accardo's run was like 50 years. Um, right. It's really insane what Tony Accardo was able to do and how he was able to shield himself, uh, insulate himself, still still be the, the final uh, uh, shot caller and have all the respect across the country and really he puppeted so much of the American mafia from Chicago and everyone kind of thinks New York as the commission. And obviously the commission played a big role, but a Carter was on the commission and from Chicago held just as much weight as any of those New York bosses. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I I've always put him on my Mount Rushmore. I think, you know, the Mount Rushmore is going to be, you know, uh, Luciano, a Cardo, I always put Salerno up there and, you know, Carlo Gambino, whoever else you want. But um, you have five or ten more minutes? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, someone's asking about Tokyo Joe, Ken Ito. What do you know about him? Yeah, Ken Ito. Yeah. Uh, so he was the uh, big gambling boss uh, from Chinatown in Chicago. Um, very powerful, non-Italian uh ken ito they called him tokyo joe or ken the kenny the jap uh he was chicago and detroit are both families that it really doesn't matter if you're italian it matters how much money you can make Mm -hmm. and if you can make them money you might never get your button because they're not going to induct you unless you're italian but you can rise just as high as anyone with their button. Uh, and, and Ken Ito was, you know, the equivalent of a made guy for being an Asian uh, out of the Chinatown crew for a good 30 years, 25, 30 years. Um, also worked in the North side uh, for the North side crew. Uh, and then that the, they made the decision to murder him. Uh, they, it was just kind of one of those things where, you know, it's like it makes me think of the end of the movie Casino when they, they're talking about whether or not to kill the guy, and everyone's like, Oh, yeah, he's a good guy. Oh, yeah, he's a stand up guy. And then at the end, the guy's like, Yeah, but why take a chance? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think Ken Ito got kind of caught up in that where no one thought for sure that he was going to rat anyone out, but he was facing a couple cases. He was getting up in age, and they worried that he could uh, turn on them. So they decided to try to kill him, and then shot him in the back of the head a couple times and it didn't kill him. He survived it and ended up then testifying. A rat. And then, then he did, then he did become a rat. Well, and, and that's the interesting thing about the whole rat thing, right? So I've said before, I don't have a problem with Peter Chiodo, fat Pete Chiodo cooperating. Fat Pete Chiodo was shot 21 times by, by Queso's people. And then his sister was almost murdered by Queso's people, I would have probably cooperated as well. <laughs> uh, so Ken Ito, uh, you know, John Vesey, another uh, example. John Vesey uh, w- was shot by the mob. Shot in the back mob. of the head and survived it. And then his brother was killed, you know, and, and, and you know, you got to look at it. But look, John Vesey was a terrible person as well. Uh, hey, and he, he took, still a, is. took a, a power drill and put it into someone's head. Yeah, that's a sick story. He talks about that. He went you know, for anyone that know John Vesey was an uh, an enforcer for John Stamp in Philadelphia. Who, by the way, John Vesey was not Italian either, full Italian. He was made. He said he had a story one time where he had a power drill and he put it to someone's head and he saw chunks of that guy's head come out. Uh, and he, he he acts like it was like a a normal thing. He's a real John, John Vesey. Are you John Vesey? 
perfectly encapsulates the John Stanford era, where these <laughs> things were so disorganized. Stanford was so out of touch with the street and was so desperate. John VC went from a construction worker to a hitman to yeah. a made man to a capo in a matter of about four months. Yeah. <laughs> or five months. Well, you know, in Stanford, was- this is this was a guy in Stanford who was like Sicilian to the core. I right. didn't give a fuck about any like rules about being Sicilian. You just yeah. made he, it was a bit of a mess and um could never wrap his arms around the problem and all of the violence that occurred because of uh that instability landed him in prison for the rest of his life. Meanwhile, Joey, you know, Joey didn't get hit with or Joey got hit with some uh, murder counts from that war, but beat them all. And then Joey was home in 12 years. Meanwhile, Stamp is doing life. And then Ralph Natale, who is just our witness against Joey, ends up doing 13 years to Joey's 12. Right. No, he it's, did more it's, time than the guy he was cooperating against. No, it's truly crazy. And that's really the, the, the wild thing about our justice system where – Someone like White Boy Rick Worsh, you can go to jail for what thirty years, thirty uh, and Nate, thirty-three years on a traffic stop, and Everyone, Nate Boone Craft can kill right. thirty people, thirty people, and get, admitted in open court. Yeah, the and Johnny is, Curry, right? who who sold how much, how many kilos? Right, Johnny Curry, people? biggest dope boss on the east side of Detroit for ten years, and he does twelve years. Yeah, it's crazy. Rick does Let me ask you. Um, one final thing, you're you're on you got the gangster report, you're writing a lot about stories. I see you're getting more and more involved with the rap side of things, which I love. I know you've always delved into that. That's something that I'm obviously very close to just because I I know who AR Ab is and I know who these people are. Um that's a pretty crazy story, isn't it? The AR Ab yeah. story. I, I just love finding the nexus between crime and pop culture, and there's really no better nexus point. Than when you're talking about the African American drug game and the world of hip hop, oh, yeah. and I'm not, I'm, I'm just stating facts here that I'm not trying to uh, disparage uh, aspiring rappers or aspiring label bosses um, or or paint with a broad stroke, but I can say confidently in my research. Dare I say, seventy-five percent of of all of the major hip hop labels were started with some form of drug money, and and that and that's just again that's just fact. I mean, a lot of these, I mean, a lot of these guys in in Philadelphia and everywhere. I mean, they all started at a one point, of yep. course. So Harvard. you just kind of have this natural cross section. Um, and I, yeah, I do. I love reporting on. I'm a, I'm an old school hip hop head. You know, I'm probably about ten years older than you, Jeff. Um, but you know, I was raised on N.W.A. and Dr. Dre and Tupac and Biggie. Um, and you know, I love I love the art form. So, and I still people tease me, and and I, I'll own it. I still listen to music like I'm 16. <laughs> like, Same. I'm, uh, and I'm and I'm going on 44, but uh, I, yeah. So I really enjoy writing about that stuff. Um, whether we're talking about the, the more recent stuff like AR Ab uh, with the original Bach Hustlers in Philly, or uh, talking about the um, you know like the Chief Keef guys in Chicago, yep. uh, the King Von guys in Chicago, uh, you know uh, the the original uh, sorry the Gangster Disciples and the Vice Lords. Um, and I know when we're talking about Black Mafia family, we can tie it all back around here. Uh, you know, Black Mafia family, you know, gave the seed money to start Bad Boy Records. Sure. And uh, not a lot of people know that because that was early BMF. Um, but uh, I've seen the DEA reports. Um, and they also helped start Murder, Inc. Uh, Harry O, who was the... Uh, the money behind Death Row Records just got out after 30 years on a, on a presidential pardon from, from Trump. Uh, and he was the money behind Suge Knight. And then uh, that was kind of a story that 
not everyone knew, but it wasn't really a secret. But then I found out after Harry O came out, he also gave the money to start Rap a Lot Records in Houston with with uh, the Ghetto Boys. Lot so I mean, you're talking about a lot of great rap music that was started because of dirty started with dirty money. It's it's crazy to think about. Last question, I promise. Who's your favorite person to cover? And I think I know what you're going to say. Well, I mean, <laughs> my favorite person to cover in terms of what I do is Joey Merlino. There's no you doubt. You love Joey. I know I you love, love Joey. Joey. I Shout love writing Joey. about him. I never get enough of writing about him. Um, he it's it's evergreen. Uh, he is. I, I've always and I've said, you know, if he was in New York City, everybody in America would know who he was. Um, he is the most compelling organized crime figure or ex-organized crime figure uh, that there is in America. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't even, uh, I don't even have to, to contemplate an answer. Shout out to Joey. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Joe. Uh, Scott, do you know anything about Rick Ross and the GD situation from a couple of years ago? Yeah, I wrote about it. Yes, I do. Uh, if you go to gangster report um, and you go to um my, uh, I got a hip hop category and I also got like a Miami car- category and a Chicago category. It's in all of it. Uh, so yeah. yeah the- go, go to Google, probably an easy way. Just type in gangster report, Rick Ross. I'm sure something will come up. I would. Uh, so yeah, he was extorted <laughs> by the gangster disciples at a, a Florida, at a Miami hotel. Um, about, uh, it was an incident in the early 2010s, I believe. Um, you know, Rick Ross is someone who's co-opted a lot of his uh, rap persona. He's taken he's the it. Big, from, he's the biggest fraud in music. Yeah, I and, I, and I like and I like Rick Ross as a Agreed. MC. He, I, I like his his style and his flow, and I like a lot of his his music. But he takes a lot of liberty with shouting out what he claims are connections to real life organized crime groups. And I can speak from talking to some members of these organized crime groups. They don't take kindly to it. Uh, And and Larry Hoover and and the gangster disciples. um, Well, I shouldn't say Larry Hoover. He, he shouts out Larry Hoover in a song. There are some members of the gangster disciples uh, that took umbrage with not just the, the Hoover reference, but other references he was making to being quote unquote down with the GDs and they accosted him at a hotel in Miami and threatened his life. Uh, and there hasn't been a ton of GD references in his music since then. No. And that's good for him. He's a smart guy for doing that. Uh, Scott, let everybody know where they can find you. You got a lot going on. You're a legend. Thanks. You wrote mafia Prince. You got all these books out. You got the gangs report. You got your podcast. What do you got coming up? So I got a couple uh, scripted content projects that I, I'm hoping I can talk about uh, more openly in the next couple of months. And by the way, California. I've heard they're going to be pretty good. I hope so. Maybe. Jeff knows a little bit. No, he knows a little something, something. Um, so we'll see. I think one of them is, is supposed to be announced pretty soon. Um, and then... Now, don't tell us who it is, but give us a... It's on a mafia member. It's, it's a mafia story that... If you if you know all the great mafia stories, this is one has been so ripe, and nobody has really tackled it. Uh, and it's and I'll, I'll give you it's a new, I'll, I'll 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 tease it enough to say it's a New York mafia story. I've heard never, it is, and it's gonna be fucking great. It's never really been touched on, and this these are major names. Uh, two guys that are behind this are icons, uh, guys that have been in countless epic all-time great movies and they're 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 digging into this material um and it's something that should be shooting uh by early 22 which means that hopefully it'll be out by uh fall of 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 22 it looks like it's going to be on hbo max that's the much that's the most i can really say right now but uh that's exciting and then i got a book project that i might be getting involved in that will also have a, a tv show component um and that's about a guy named frank panessa 
who invented undercover work for the DEA um, and went undercover into uh, a bunch of different mafia families. So we got that. I got my podcast, Original Gangsters. You can get it uh, wherever podcasts are consumed. Uh, get me on Twitter or Facebook, uh, Bernie's Tweets, B-U-R-N-E-Y-S-T-W-E-E-T-S. Uh, Gangster Report is www.gangsterreport.com. You can get it on Facebook. We're approaching like almost 500,000 500, followers on the Facebook page. So check it out. And um, you'll be seeing a lot of me and Jeff, hopefully, uh, going back and forth, uh, you know, cross-pollinating our, our brand. I, I love Scott. He's a great guy. Uh, I also want to shout out a guy you know very well, the great Al Prophet. He does a lot yes. of great Al's a work. partner of mine. Uh, he's my partner in Gangster Report. We've done a bunch of documentaries together. Uh, definitely one of the best, uh, you know, when it comes to guerrilla-style filmmaking uh, on the documentary tip. He's probably the best there is in the country. Best there he is. He did a game. great documentary a long time ago on Frank Matthews. It's yeah. Very he went good. to New. He went. Well, it shows you how dedicated it is. He went to New. We're Al's from Detroit, like me. He went to New York for about a year and embedded in Harlem, and and was Incredible. talking to uh, you know a lot of uh, Matthews' former guys and greatest drug uh, dealer in the history of this country. Yeah, and he's probably still alive, sipping a mai tai somewhere on a beach. It's it's really a fascinating story, and we're definitely going to do it on my show coming up here soon. Uh, Scott, great to see you. Great to talk to you. People really enjoyed you coming on. We'll have to do it again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. All right. See you, brother. Um, Scott Bernstein joining me live here. Uh, we're going to wrap it up because we gave you it all. We, I don't want to cut into other people. I know other people are probably doing shows right now. Uh, went a little bit longer than I wanted, but – you know, I, w- I would probably have stayed on longer, but, you know, y- you got to end it at some point. I'm Jeff Nadu. Make sure you subscribe if you enjoy the content. We appreciate it. Uh, and go check out my podcast, The Sit Down, an organized crime podcast. Did a great show this week on Tony Duck's Corallo, uh, 20th episode. Um, I'm killing this show. We're killing it. We're over 250,000 views. I'm so happy with this. And we've had great people like Scott on and. Um, We really just give it to you raw. We don't talk about this dumb nonsense. We just talk about people. We talk compelling stories, and we have a great show. So uh, we'll try to get some more guests on soon uh, and uh, go from there. So uh, thanks for watching. See you next time.